Welcome to the to the third block of the European of the Future of the European Union conference. My name is Viktor Jaszczuk, and together with Amelie Verbruggen, we will be conducting this interview. Throughout this block, we will touch upon subjects such as the recovery of the EU econ economy after the COVID-19 pandemic, the impacts of foreign economies, and the future of the Eurozone in this post-pandemic reality. With a lot of with a lot of pleasure, we'd like to introduce to our guest uh, of this interview, Mr. Janusz Lewandowski, a true expert uh, on the many aspects of the European economy. Mr. Lewandowski is an accomplished politician and economist, is a current member of the European Parliament and the former European Commissioner for Financial Programming and the Budget. Welcome. Good morning. I am ready for action. Sir, to begin this interview, let me ask you a question about the uh, about the shape of the European economy. What, what are the main advantages and disadvantages of the European producers? How, uh, how, how may the EU market compete with other market powers such as China and the United States? Well, uh, first of all, this is good to have your, your voice and eventual commitment to the debate over the future of Europe. As for the state of Europe, this is not different from the other continents. All of the continents are, are really recovering from pandemia. Uh, Europe are really heavily hit. Europe is no longer uh, a sort of new brave world. Europe was very optimistic after so-called reunification. This was the end of of 20th century and nothing of from uh, absolutely not corresponding to the foundation climate. Now we have continuous uh, crisis management in 21st century. And the paradox is that all the three major crises were born outside Europe. First of all, financial crisis that was import from US, US infecting European economy and uh, European economy really suffering a lot because this is credit, banking credit dependent economy and not so much capital markets dependent economy. Second was migration crisis that is coming because of wave of refugees, peak was 2015, uh, refugees from Syria, from Africa. And the third now is global, uh, but also born in China, exported to, to Europe by China. Good news is that Europe is learning and we have new architecture of the Eurozone as a result, as a conclusion of the financial crisis. We have asylum and migration funds in the European budget and also border protection as a result, as a conclusion from migration crisis. And now a lot of uh, inventions beginning of a health, uh, health uh, Europe as, as the conclusion from pandemic crisis. Of course, we are not the strongest uh, part of, uh, of the world. The main sources of growth are now beyond the European Union. What is expected for, for this year is the growth um, ranging 4%. Of course, this is uh, very asymmetric, asymmetric um, uh, impact of on pandemia. Uh, it's a pity, but really the same countries which were hit mostly by the financial crisis and refugee crisis, but the South uh, south of Europe were mostly hit by pandemic crisis also. But the, the prospect is to, to recover in the second half of, of this year, possibly to return to the pre-crisis uh, level uh, in 2022. The growth should be around 4%. Uh, so uh, the, the most important is what lessons we are drawing from, from the crisis. Uh, and how to make Europe more innovative, because for sure, for sure, uh, this is not the most innovative part of, of global economy. What is the cost of a crisis due to the national uh, national shields protecting from, from pandemic uh, uh, limitations is, of course, growing deficit uh, overall in the European Union, budgetary deficit, difficult to, to overcome in the next years, and also growing debt. But that is on average 99% in, in the Eurozone. That is really a lot. And this is going to be a lasting, a lasting burden uh, after, after this pandemic crisis. 
So differentiated outlook, but more optimistic with vaccination uh, and lifting of all these containment measures, which were so damaging and that disruptive for the European economy in 2020. Yes, that was very interesting. Sir, could you please tell us how, has, uh, how Brexit affected the spending plans of the EU? Unfortunately, we have Brexit. Uh, they are leaving the European Union, but uh, what remains is British language, which is language number uh, number one in the European Union. Also, uh, although you you should probably know that the, the language of reference when there are lingu linguistic disputes is French. Uh, we are uh, seated in Brussels, we are seated in Strasbourg, and uh, French, although not so popular as English, is the uh, language of uh, of reference in case of uh, linguistic controversies. Uh, fortunately, this was uh, orderly in Brexit and not disorderly, rather for less expensive for, for Europe and for uh, for United Kingdom. Uh, budgetary implications are not the only dimension of Brexit. You know that this is a problem of Poles uh, in, living in, in Great Britain. It has geopolitical implications. Uh, what was common for, for, for us and for Great Britain was also that they were very much market-oriented country. And now we have a lot of protection in, in, the, in the European Union. As for the budgetary implications, UK is contributing as number three net payer, all, despite the so-called rebate that was the, the, the well, contribution of Margaret Thatcher. Uh, according to the withdrawal agreement, they should uh, commit to, the, to, to all the programs. Uh, this, this is about uh, what this, uh, I can say my budget, because I was uh, designing budget, European budget for 2014-2020, but the programs should terminate by 2023, and UK is obliged by the withdrawal uh, treaty to, to commit to these programs. As for the future, we have several models of cooperation with outside world, so-called EFTA, that is European Free Trade Association, that is, uh, that is about Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway and Switzerland. They are participating in European programs and contributing to the European budget. Uh, for example, Norway is, is contributing um, more than 900 million euro annually and the same should be for British because they are eager to participate in research and development. They were the big beneficiaries of research and development in the past. The fantastic Cambridge, Oxford, London School of Economics and they want to, to commit therefore to participate. What is a real loss is for you, for your generation, is Erasmus. Erasmus is coming back after pandemia. Great Britain was the most promising uh, uh, destination for many of our students because of this mentioned fantastic uh, schools like Cambridge, Oxford or, or London School of Economics. By the, but they have cal calculated their costs and for them this is not a, uh, not, not a, a fiscal advantage to participate because everybody would like to go to, to Great Britain, not so many Brits, are ready to go to the continental Europe. So we have Brexit and and Brexit from Erasmus. It's, it's a pity, really. Yes, thank you for, very much for your answer, sir. We also have another question. How can the European Union stop the offshoring of factories to countries of low labor standards? Is the idea of, uh, of low tariffs working in favor or against uh, the business of the union? Here is a real problem for, for the, for the uh, European Union. Uh, we have major challenges. I would like to mention one more, although not asked about. Uh, we are aging. We are really old continent. Uh, it, Europe was around 15% of the, uh, of the uh, 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 global population. Now this is less than 7%. And so-called Mediana for Europe is 45 years on average. Uh, for Africa, uh, that is 21 
this is really a demographic bomb. But your question was about offshoring, and this is a question about overregulation of our European Union. So we should uh, evaluate all our regulations uh, from that point of view, whether this is encouraging European or international companies uh, to go outside European Union, which is which is fact, fact of life, or how to make it, uh, how to, how to make European Union more friendly for investment, including Poland, how to make it less regulated. When I was a commissioner, uh, I think what was valuable was so-called refit exercise, that is a monitoring of all the regulations, eventually lifting some of them, which are most damaging for the competitive position of Europe. Europe is around 7% of population globally, around 20% of GDP, but around 50% of social expenditure. This is politically popular, but of course not enhancing competitiveness of, of our Europe. So the question is about really regulation, deregulation, and not so much about tariffs, because we are we are the part of the World Trade Organization, and this is much more difficult and and provoking revenge from from US or China. Difficult to compete with that sort of regulation with China and and US. Thank you very much for your answer. On a slightly different note, um, when considering the future of the European economy, we cannot overlook the imprint COVID-19 had on it. Could you outline the European response to the outbreak and its consequences on the economy? Why do you think so many member states criticized this response mechanism? And what effects did this, all those multiple lockdowns and overall COVID restrictions have on the EU's single market economy? Well, this is usual to blame Brussels for all the difficulties and and reward national governments for all the achievements. This is the story of, 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 of European Union integration. Uh, at the beginning, uh, response to the COVID was really chaotic, was very much national, even egoistic, closing borders, uh, disrupting uh, deliveries of medicines. But then came the, the era, which is now to continue, of solidarity and common response. As I have mentioned, uh, this is not the first crisis. This is crisis number three. Not uh, We are victims, we are suffering, but this was not born in, in Europe. Uh, Europe was hit in asymmetric way. Also, I have mentioned that the most hit are the countries also suffering from financial crisis and refugee crisis that is around Mediterranean. Now we have a lot of solidarity and solidarity response. We have the beginning of health Europe, uh, increasing uh, medical responsibilities, although this is the domain of national states. It, it is very important to remember that, uh, that uh, those who are criticizing Europe for not sufficient response are mainly the populist parties and the countries which, uh, which are uh, demanding less competences for for Europe and more, and not more competences for Europe. But Europe was reacting, uh, I think, April 2020 was the beginning of, of a really response. This was, there was agreement over the, over the uh, package amounting to 540 billion euro, that is response of uh, European stability mechanism, action by European Central Bank, by the way, also European Central Bank uh, is criticized for, for this action. Uh, mainly Germans are saying that this is beyond what, what the treaties, uh, European treaties allow. Uh, but I think Europe is, since April 2020, reacting on the brink, on the edge of what is feasible under the present cities. Now everything is in, uh, under the shadow of this huge new generation a, a new generation fund, but it's a real display of, of European a, solidarity. 24 million, billion euro in grants for Poland, 34 in loans for cheap loans for Poland. That is a lot. That is supplementing multi-annual budget 2021 to 2027. Uh, much less known 
and in the shadow of new generation fund is very innovative sure program that is to compensate those who are losing uh, the wages or salaries in Europe. That is 100 billion euro, quite a lot in loans to, to the member states, 11 uh, billion euro uh, for Poland uh, alone. So this is not only the response with this famous already new generation fund, which is huge, which is without precedent, which means a lot of borrowing built on on the credibility of European budget. European budget has highest possible credibility. So I am confidential, confident that borrowing already started it will be a success story. What is the weakest point of the program known as new generation EU is really repayment scheme. We need new taxation in order to repay this new generation. And this is going to be your responsibility because uh, repayment starts 2027. So the paradox in this name is that now we are borrowing, uh, we are spending, that is easy to spend, but most difficult is to repay. Uh, and this is starting, uh, I mean, capital rates and not interest. Uh, after 2027. So possibly new generation EU should be responsibility of your generation. Thank you very much. And regarding this, which country do you consider the true loser of the pandemic and which state may have benefited the most from it? There are only losers. There are no beneficiaries of, of, of pandemic. Uh, uh, this is really a symmetric shock for, for Europe. Uh, I have to repeat once more that this is uh, really the problem of, of Greece, this is a problem of uh, Italy, Spain, not so much Portugal, uh, countries so much affected by the financial crisis and the consequences are rather grave because uh, in many countries this is fueling populist recipes populist, simplistic uh, responses to the crisis. So we have uh, the rise of populism due uh, um, to the management of, of, of pandemic crisis. This is also a problem of uh, asymmetric shield, anti-pandemic shield. Of course, Germany may allow for bigger spending in this respect, bigger protection, better protection than, for example, Italy and Greece. That is why the so-called um, new generation fund, and especially the major part of this new generation EU, that is recovery and resilience fund, is so much uh, channeled to, to the south. Spain and Italy are the biggest beneficiaries of this fund, uh, three times as much as, as, as grants for Poland. Even France, which was hit also, uh, has more in this, uh, in this uh, fund than Poland. Germany has the same amount as Poland. So clearly, uh, Greece has a lot. Uh, clearly, the, the construction of this, uh, of this recovery and resilience fund, which is a major part of new generation EU, uh, was done for the benefit, to the benefit of, of, of this most affected uh, countries. There are no winners. They are only losers. The, play, uh, the question is to uh, the scale of loss and not the scale of, of uh, advantage. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, while you had already mentioned a bit about the recovery plan, could you maybe uh, tell us exactly what the EU recovery fund is and what possibility does it offer and how it could, ca how can it uh, contribute to a more effective and stronger European Union? Could it be considered a uh, beginning of a new era? This is something without precedent. Europe, uh, Europe's solidarity was mainly visible via so-called multi-annual multi frameworks, multi-annual uh, budgets. This is unique for Europe to have to have a multi-annual budget. Now this is for seven years. Uh, now we have the end of what I was uh, designing, that is 2014-2020. 
uh, we should terminate soon the programs under this uh, multi-annual framework. The beginning is with this new one, 2021-2027. But a part of this, as a special response to the crisis, we have uh, we have this recover and resilience facility. This is not 100% of new generation new fund, but are some other contributions from the from the uh, potential European uh, Union. And so, out of seven, uh, 750 billion euro altogether for a new generation fund, we have for this recovery and resilience fund facility that is called recovery and resilience facility. We have six, 672 billion in grants, and we have I don't know this is altogether. But what is making the 772 billion is about 312 grants and 360 loans. And of course, there are, there are some conditionalities. Money should be linked with the rule of law, which is not a good message for, for the present government in, in Poland. But first of all, money should be green in 37 percent this is for green investment i think you you appreciate that sort of conditionality 20 percent is for digital uh, so there are conditionalities also also for poland uh, to, and we cannot spend without meeting this criteria uh, there is a lot of uh, this is convenient fund uh, in the normal multi-annual framework uh, we have co-financing and it might be a problem for, for some local authorities because they need to you know, take a debt in order to co-finance unions programs. Now with this new recovery and resilience facility, there is no co-financing. Everything is coming from, from uh, Brussels. Of course, I, as I have mentioned, it should be about green investment because the absolute priority uh, for the European Union is so-called Green Deal. So, so here is competitive advantage also of, 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 of Europe. Uh, that, is, that is really good. So uh, that is not only about recovery of, of, of uh, European Union, that is also about making it more climate friendly, which is a part of the strategy to making Europe uh, climate neutral uh, by 2050. So the funds should be channeled in such a way that is, that is allowing to reach very ambitious goals of reduction of CO2 emissions by 55% uh, by 2030, making Europe uh, climate neutral by 2050. Fortunately, uh, Europe is no longer alone. Uh, Europe is uh, committing uh, around 9% of overall global CO2 um, emissions. Therefore, we cannot fight the climate warming um, without cooperation from the other continents. Fortunately, we have Biden and not Trump on the other side of the Atlantic. And Biden uh, is also committing US to climate neutrality. China is also announcing uh, climate neutral goals. The same for Japan, for Korea. So now we have a much bigger family uh, to be included in fighting uh, climate warming. And the, the recovery and resilience facility uh, should be used also uh, to, uh, to attain this goal. We have some problems with our part, national part of recovery and resilience facility because uh, we don't want uh, the spending to be done in a non-transparent uh, way, uh, really uh, benefiting uh, politically convenient local authorities, organizations in, in our country. So here is, here is our additional conditionality. It has to be spent in a transparent, politically neutral way in Poland. Thank you for your answer, sir. And sir, recently there was an EU directive ordering multinational corpor corporations to provide information about their tax payments in each of the EU member states. 
How do you think this directive will affect the fight against tax havens, which many EU leaders point out to be the biggest problem of the EU? That is a good message, because now we have global agreement and, and, and global cooperation and fighting tax havens. And, and the crusade, the uh, strategy of fighting tax havens cannot be national, cannot be even European. It has to be a global, global uh, really to, to uh, detect aggressive tax uh, tax optimization. Uh, so now we have green light globally uh, for the minimal rate. Minimal rate is much higher than in some countries and in especially in tax havens because the minimal rate for corporations for corporate tax should be fifteen uh, percent. Uh, we have also estimated that annually, uh, uh, the globally we are losing more than four hundred billion uh, dollars due to this optimal due to this aggressive tax optimization and the presence of uh, of uh, tax havens. To my surprise, Poland is not quite happy about this agreement of the minimal rate of uh, corporate tax. Um, because uh, we would like to attract foreign investment and uh, and actual rate of of taxation for uh, those invest uh, for international companies coming to Poland and creating jobs is less than ten percent. So below what was agreed, what was uh, what was agreed was minimal fifteen percent. The actual uh, factual uh, rate uh, the international corporations are paying in Poland is 10% therefore Polish reservations as to, the, as to the agreement, but it has to be global. It cannot be national. On a slightly different note, uh, sort of this new reality dictated by the pandemic with several countries postponing their euro currency transition and with many EU member state candidates on the waiting list, is the transition of member states to the Eurozone still a priority? No, this is no longer a priority. I, I was really afraid uh, several years ago after the financial crisis that we could have really uh, two speed Europe. Eurozone uh, more and more separated from the rest of, of Europe. Now we have 19 member countries of, of the Eurozone. I was afraid uh, even that uh, this was, in, this was uh, a part of a plan for Europe to have separate separate uh, budget of eurozone amounting to hundreds of billions of euro nothing like this happened fortunately we have some uh, money for eurozone uh, included into the overall budget for 27 uh, countries uh, were, there were also plans for separate uh, chamber of european parliament for eurozone that would mean really to speed Euro on the margins of this core union, core union. I think now this is not quite a priority. Uh, I am afraid that Eurozone countries are not quite waiting for Poland or, um, or the other countries which are still outside. Some of them have so-called option to stay outside, that is Denmark. Uh, Sweden is uh, very much against entering Eurozone. Poland, politically, politically in Poland, this is not feasible to have now a rational debate over the Euro with clear advantages, especially in the crisis situations. It is better to, to be safe in Eurozone than uh, outside the Eurozone. But the, the, the national propaganda now, nowadays is really uh, creating fears. Uh, and it would be really difficult to convince politically uh, now in the referendum uh, polls to enter Eurozone. This is uh, not quite a priority. We have major challenges ahead of Europe, that is migration, that is climate, that is innovation, and uh, to speed Europe is not so big challenge for countries like like uh, like Poland or Czech Republic uh, nowadays 
bigger challenges ahead of us and uh, a lot of learning uh, from, from various dimensions of pandemic crisis. For example, just to mention one, uh, I have mentioned that we have really a sort of uh, uh, health union, although this was normally not in the competences of the, of the, uh, of the European Union. Uh, for example, what, sh what is to be enhanced as a lesson from pandemic crisis is so-called European Centre for Disease for Prevention and, uh, and Controls. We should have much better uh, early warning systems in the European Union. Uh, we should be much more self-sufficient in medicines, ingredients and pharmaceutical industry. I am proud that really the most demanded medicine uh, uh, in, uh, globally, that is vaccination, was developed in Europe and uh, the company BioNTech Pfizer was really financed with Euro funds from my budget. So I am proud that I, um, Europe was number one in this respect, should be number one. And uh, here are the real challenges for, for, uh, uh, for United Europe. No longer a strong uh, deepening of the uh, Euro, uh, of the uh, Eurozone. Eurozone was very much developed as, a, as, a, as the conclusion of uh, uh, financial crisis. We have a stable stability mechanism. We have uh, capital markets union. We have fiscal union. Not so much banking union, because this is still work in progress. Very important uh, elements of this banking union are missing. For example, common European insurance scheme to, to safeguard the, the savings of, of citizens. This is still missing. So uh, still a job to be done. And here are major challenges for the future. Thank you very much for your answer, sir. And we have another question. Europe is often called the pension house of the world. Its, GDPs, uh, its GDP growth is averaging below 2%, which is, when, uh, which is low when compared to Asian tigers or other rising economies. So our question is, what are the potential so solutions to stop this process and make Europe great again? Well, 18th century, 19th century, uh, Europe was the most innovative continent uh, globally. Uh, no longer, when you see the list of 15 biggest high-tech companies, uh, only American, only Chinese, no one from, from, uh, from Europe. The most iconic uh, companies in Europe, for example, Siemens or Nokia, uh, are no longer uh, to be comparable uh, with uh, Google, with Amazon, with, with uh, so-called big high-tech companies from, uh, from America. I am afraid that uh, you cannot reproduce on our continent uh, the very unique si Silicon Valley uh, ecosystem because they have everything in Silicon Valley. They, are, they have fantastic universities, Stanford and Berkeley, they have a lot of venture capital ready to uh, invest in risky uh, in startups. And they have a culture of risk taking. And in, uh, in America, failure is the beginning of a new life. It's a good chance to begin again. In, in, uh, in Europe, failure, business failure is a failure. So this is, uh, here is a different difference uh, as, as to the and culture of risk taking. Uh, we are financing a lot of infrastructure for, uh, for start arts. Uh, I think we have good prospect for investment in, in the new uh, companies in 2021 that should jump to more than 20 billion euro uh, in, in the United Europe. Uh, previously, this was around eight or nine billion euro, but I uh, even the most successful clusters uh, like Stockholm or Berlin cannot be unfortunately uh, compared to the Silicon Valley value and to the state industry of technology advance uh, built, uh, built in uh, China. 
we have now a commitment, or I think it should be the rule, uh, to spend around 3% of GDP for research and development. This is looking badly in many countries of, of, uh, uh, of uh, European Union. Uh, but we have also strong points. I have mentioned uh, biotechnics, uh, pharmaceutical industry, uh, uh, this is not enough. This is not enough. Uh, what 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 we need investment uh, in our cloud, in our databases, uh, with uh, with uh, in new battery technologies, and we should invest. This is a case of Poland uh, recently, in cyber security. We have special agency for cyber security in European Union, and this is one of the major problems we are facing now, uh, nowadays globally. Uh, but I have to admit, uh, European Union, despite all the efforts, all the uh, strategies, because there was a strategy um, promising Europe to be the most competitive and innovative part uh, of the world economy by 2010, no, I think the gap between US and the uh, European Union is bigger now than in 2000 in 2010 a lot could be done a lot could be done we are strong when we are together we have very innovative uh, uh, and now investment in into the fusion energy which is called ITER Europe is strong really and managing uh, competitive uh, competition with China and the United States only when we are united and uh, we are committing as 27 and not uh, one country or the other alone. Thank you for your answer, sir. And we have another question. So, would the EU benefit from becoming a federation or would it be better uh, off as a market of homelands? Uh, now, uh, uh, the debate over the future of Europe has, has, has been started. I am happy that you would like to, to have your contribution because future is in your hands. Europe is an open project and has no finalité. This was fan, fashionable to, to discuss future of Europe in federalist terms, but this is, Europe is an open project, responding to the new challenges and raising to the new challenges without finality, without final final scheme of uh, how it should look uh, like. Uh, Europe is developing in the logic of evolution and not revolution. This is typical for the open society to develop uh, evolutionary and not revolutionary. Uh, there is no going, there is no uh, chance for federal state of Europe for a simple reason. There is no European nation. There are nations that are ingredients, that are parts of, of, of this Europe without, without borders. I, this is really a fantastic achievement so far, and given the, the, the past. Europe was the continent of conflicts, wars, peace was exceptional between uh, continuous conflicts and wars. And now we have open continent uh, with this uh, European Parliament, fully fledged European Parliament. And we should think of how to raise to the uh, new challenges and not to think about federal uh, state of Europe. There is no European nation. There is a, a really a European identity built on uh, built on common memory, common cultural heritage, uh, ranging, uh, dating from Greeks, uh, Roman uh, law, Christianity, Renaissance, Enlightenment, but also drawing on the lesson of uh, two world wars, which were born on our continent and exported to the other uh, con uh, uh, continents. So here is European identity, here is common heritage, making Europe without borders possible, but this is not going in the future to, to, to be transformed into the federal state of Europe. 
Thank you for your answer. Circling back to a previous question on the Eurozone again, what effect on the Eurozone can we expect as the world slowly starts to open to the public again and the restrictions are being lifted on travel and trade? I, the beginning of, 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 of response was really nationalistic, protectionist, but this is over. Uh, we have learned how to respond to pandemic crisis without closing borders. I've, with progress of vaccination, which is visible in Europe of our continent, we are the only continent really exporting vaccination to the poor countries. Uh, I am uh, more optimistic about resuming what is the European way of life. Uh, there is something like, like European way of life. Uh, when I was a commissioner, and we have so we, there were many promises with so-called Arab Spring on, on the other side of the Mediterranean Sea, starting in 2011 in Tunisia. Uh, our commission had continuous monitoring of social media in Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, and the other countries because everything was in the social media for the younger generation. And to our surprise, their, their dreamland, their dreamland was not American dream, but Europe. Europe was uh, for this younger generation a symbol of good life, and I think it is. And it, it will be proved with relaxation, lifting of these containment measures, with vaccination and progress of economy. Uh, progress is, uh, and a social, a social uh, uh, pillar a social responsibility of Europe is essential uh, to somehow uh, not allow for the progress of, of populist movements uh, in, in, in Europe, because crisis is normally a good, uh, good uh, land, good opportunity for, for the populist parties to, to, to deliver uh, simple answers, simplistic answers to the real difficult problems. Thank you. And moving on to the final question coming from the two of us. Um, sir, what in your opinion is the most important current long-term goal of the European economy? The most important is, of course, to be a part of this competitive, competitive um, uh, global uh, market. Europe is quite good, uh, quite well placed on so-called value chain. So we have many of the, uh, of the uh, end products, high-tech products, uh, delivery of, of supply coming from the other continents, but, but final product produced in Europe, so here is our advantage. But we are clearly losing uh, this innovation race with China and US. So I think here is the most important challenge, only to be uh, to be met with united forces of European Union and, of course, with the, uh, with the assistance of the regular budget to be uh, uh, digitalization. Digital Europe is, is, uh, is, I think, a main challenge. Fortunately, also in this uh, recovery and resilience fund, uh, we, we should spend 20% of the overall um, sum for digital Europe, and here is here is our future. Thank you very much for your question, uh, for your answer. I'm sorry, um, it appears that there are no questions from the audience at this very moment, or they are yeah. still being prepared. So we would like just a short moment of intermission. It's too hot, too hot for a real exchange. Oh, yes, uh, the weather has been acting up uh, recently, but at least we get to enjoy the beautiful sun for now.
and we have a question um, from the audience because tomorrow um, during our model European Council debate, uh, our participants uh, will try to answer the question, um, which we have already kind of mentioned during today's um, interview already. Um, they will try to answer the question um, whether the European countries which have not yet adopted the EU currency still should um, be working towards it and should the um, members, the countries waiting on the European Union's member um, waiting list for the, to become a European uh, Union member state, uh, should they also uh, have it at the back of their mind that one day they will be ought to adopt the euro. So uh, what would be your advice, um, sir, for our um, participants tomorrow? How should they tackle this issue? Well, it should be your, uh, your answer and not my answer. Uh, with the exception of UK, which is no longer member state, but leaving us with, with fantastic and easy English language. Uh, two countries have uh, to have option, Denmark. Uh, Denmark is now obliged to, to enter Eurozone, but all the other member states are obliged without giving date uh, to enter Eurozone. This is also a part of Polish accession treaty. That is obligation to go in uh, without date. And I have said that there is really no uh, no climate, no political climate nowadays uh, for the real discussion over euro or non-euro in our country. There is too much of populistic suggestions and the populist propaganda. Uh, so uh, euro should be our goal. Euro means safety in time of crisis because they have better, uh, they are better equipped with all sorts of uh, early warning systems, safety nets like European stability mechanism. They have uh, European Central Bank rather oriented towards Eurozone and not uh, towards non-Euro countries. This is obligation of uh, European Central Bank. So the tool, the toolbox of Eurozone is good in time of, uh, of crisis. And this is one additional a part of treaty obligations. This is one more, uh, one more motivation, uh, uh, incentive uh, to be a part of Eurozone in the future. Not to be on the margins, because there is no big race of deepening of Eurozone, uh, as I have mentioned nowadays. We have um, different, more important challenges ahead of us in, in, in the European Union. But anyway, uh, there is progress built up of, institution, uh, of institutions of Eurozone, and we are outside, and this is not good for the future of Polish economy. This is also about investment credibility. Mm -hmm. Of course. And one more question coming in from the audience, um, because during this conference, we are trying to uh, focus on the challenges that the future of the European Union will bring to our generation. And recently, uh, we see a trend of focusing on making the economy uh, so-called circular. So how will this trend, um, if at all, uh, influence any trade uh, policies or um, the economy as a whole? Well, making Europe a secular economy uh, is a part of Green Deal uh, strategy. Uh, you probably know that uh, among the candidates for the new taxation to repay new generation EU is, uh, is taxation on, on non-recycled plastics. And I am sure that younger generation is fully confident that this is a necessity because really plastics are damaging our planet. Poland is, for Poland, this is not quite uh, uh, advantageous taxation. We should pay around half a billion uh, euro of this taxation annually because we have less uh, recycled uh, plastics than in the other countries, but we have also compensation in such a case, more than 100 uh, million euro annually, because uh, the other countries are recognizes that we are rather slow in this respect. 
so we should be assisted somehow on, uh, on our way to a, towards a world free of plastics. This is a part of overall campaign for Green, Lean, uh, Green Deal. This is, I think, quite understandable in your generation and your voice is very strong in this respect. Uh, and this is, this is really helpful to convince also my generation. Thank you very much for your answer. And we have one more question. Um, could you maybe tell us a bit more about what the EU economy's place is exactly on the whole world scale? And what exactly is the plan to, for its place in the world's economy? Uh, Europe was a superpower in economic terms. Uh, and now facing uh, facing uh, challenges I have mentioned, I would mention very much the challenge of depopulation and aging society. Uh, we are not uh, we are not supplied like US with creative uh, brains. Our refugees are possibly desperate and uh, escaping from war, from hunger in Africa. Uh, so this is not uh, that sort of migration that is coming to Silicon Valley because they are somehow collecting uh, brains and uh, especially in Eastern Europe, we are uh, not only depopulated, but also uh, losing brains. For example, Latvia, since, the, uh, since the, the, they have started their membership in the European Union, uh, was losing more than 25% of the population. They are moving westwards. The same, uh, more or less more the same is for Lithuania and for Bulgaria. But you are also conscious of how many Poles are looking better life on the, in the UK or Germany or in Scandinavia. Uh, but aging population is one of the major challenges of Europe. Uh, we have we have absorbed 1 billion 500 migrants uh, from outside Europe. This was a peak, this was 2015. But you can imagine that these are poor people looking for better life and uh, not necessarily uh, the, the big promise uh, for this innovative technology uh, overall on, on our continent. I wish them best, probably, they are also talented, but they, they, this is escape from, from disaster and uh, not necessarily looking for uh, to, 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 to reinforce uh, centers of innovation in, in, in Europe. But still, Europe is alive, still well placed on this value chain, uh, drawing lessons from financial crisis, drawing lessons from migration crisis, drawing uh, lessons from pandemia. Uh, and this is a good message, but we are learning. We are raising to the challenges. Thank you very much. And unfortunately, as insightful as this interview has been, we are reaching the end of the block. So if you have any closing remarks or a message to our younger audience, uh, could you please tell it to us? The only reasonable message is that future of Europe is in your, in your hands, therefore you should be committed to the debate over the future of Europe, but also European future of Poland uh, is in your hands. The European Union cannot uh, defend Polish uh, democracy or rule of law uh, because this was uh, this is a construction with the other dimensions. So we cannot uh, the European Union and European Union institutions are not to not capable of replacing Polish nation in defending uh, our economy, defending our, uh, our rule of law and our democracy. Okay, so thank you very much you. for your thank answer. You for your and this concludes our blog on the European economy. Thank you so much for all your answers. Uh, for, uh, and yeah, just thank you very much, Mr. Lewandowski, for today. I'm sure we all learned a lot from this interview. Thank you as well to everybody who participated. And we now invite you to the next interview on the subject of the EU home affairs, democracy and law. Thank you again, Mr. Lewandowski, for all your insightful words and goodbye.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's hope that Robert Lewandowski will, should be should be effective to, tomorrow against Sweden.